blue-tipped Guadarrama looms over Madrid, historic capital of Spain, rivaling Madrid as center of attraction and progress is the beautiful and busy metropolis of Barcelona. Steeped in tradition, the Iberian Peninsula, once the greatest power in the world, is a land of romance, beauty, and eternal sunshine. The Spanish peasants are a simple and joyous people who have toiled and lived in peace with no thought of the menacing avalanche of war and ruin hanging over them. Spain was known as a land of great natural wealth, a land of wonder cities, a land of royal splendor under his majesty, Alfonso XIII, last king of Spain. But all was not peace in Spain, and the civil guards frequently charged turbulent crowds. Towards the end of 1930, a huge mass meeting is celebrated in the bullring of Madrid. The people want a democratic government to replace the outworn monarchy. On April 14, 1931, a sweeping election results in a bloodless revolution. Alfonso is exiled, and La Republica is acclaimed by jubilant throngs. But political and social unrest continued unabated. And in the month of July, 1936, the world was shocked by the news of General Franco's military uprising in Spanish Morocco. The smoldering fires spread immediately to the peninsula and the land burst into sudden flame. In the big cities, the revolt was met by the spontaneous resistance of the unarmed Spanish masses and was dominated in the first days. The coup d'etat of the army generals had failed, but the pledged support of powerful interests encouraged the rebels to continue the fight. And on the 19th of July, the order of attack was given and the martial forces of the insurgents marched into the city's towns and villages of Spain and open fire on the masses in the attempt to seize power and control of the government. The document which follows portrays actual scenes of the conflict, scenes of enthusiasm and revolutionary fire, Scenes of fierce battle, filmed and recorded for the first time in war by official government cameramen in the midst of the fray. They will tell their own story, the story of a whole people rising in defense of their liberty against an armed invasion to restore feudal privileges and royal dynasty. Street barricades were thrown up and the workers fought bravely and grimly to repel the aggressors. It was a day of huge sacrifice and heroism. The city became a furnace of burning passion, and the proletarian youth formed a crucible in which the revolutionary fires were fused. Soldiers who were led to believe they were defending the government surrendered their arms and embraced the impetuous youth to the cry of Viva la Repubblica! Telephone and telegraph buildings converted into fortresses by the insurgents were stormed and captured by the loyal forces. Foreign warships hastened to Spain and anchored in the port of Barcelona. The military headquarters on Paseo Colón, where the ringleader, General Gauzen, was made prisoner after a grueling cannonade and heavy toll of lies. Motor vehicles played a prominent part in the street battles. 
After defeating the uprising, militia controls are organized at strategic points of the city on the watch for fascist snipers. An anti-fascist militia is created and the free people of Spain prepare themselves for a civil war unparalleled in human history. A war between a military machine and an improvised army of masses. Farmers, workers, teachers, doctors, poets, nurses. Fai, fai, venete, fai, fai, venete, cry the libertarian youth of Iberia. Under the glorious banner of the Fai, the first columns are organized to march to Aragon to help free their comrades in Saragossa. Enthusiasm is unbounded. There is no distinction in sex, men and women, young and old. Everyone who can carry a gun is eager to join. The Guardias del Salto salute the multitude with raised fists. The multitude applauds. captured from the insurgents on the way to Saragossa. The militiamen march on. They leave their homes, their wives, their children. All are inspired with a profound ideal of social justice. Pedralbe's armory, now dedicated to Michael Bakuni. Armored cars constructed by the workers of the Senate IET-5. No one thinks of death. There's only one thought. Liberty, it's comrade Garcia Oliver, a friend has just greeted, one of the greatest leaders of the five. Salute, Aguiluchas of the five, firm and brave companions of our libertarian struggle. On they march, the families accompanying them and saying goodbye. Salute, Aguiluchos. On, on to victory. The future is yours. Forward. The eyes of the Spanish workers are on you. The world knows your courage and your spotless loyalty. Forward, Aguiluchos over the dry and barren plain, towards Bucharalov and Barbastro, the motor lorries rush along the white... The combatants of the Confederation, their hearts full of courage, their rifles ready, are impatient to enter the battle against fascism and the rest of Spain. Duruti discusses plans with his comrades. Our comrades prepare the ground 
and reconnoiter. There in the field, the brave militiamen proceed on the way to Bucharalov. The village streets have become warlike and noisy with the coming and going of our heroic defenders of liberty. Comrade is addressing the militia with passionate words. They listen, wrapped in attention. All have the noble ambition to triumph or to die. Assembled on the high road, the valiant militia wait for the order to assume the march. Again they march on, across the fields, over the hills and through the valleys. Driving the fascist horde out of Pina across the river Ebro, the brave militia of the Senate Fai take to pick and shovel to fortify their positions. Under a scorching heat, the fighters quench their thirst. Heliograph signal. The enemy counterattacks from across the river. Our brave lads reply with conviction and with effect.
cruel face of war in its terrible destruction of homes and lives. Use of the five improvised troops of artillery. The Ruby Column chose not the name of fear. Enter in triumph. The folks welcome the victorious militants of the Senate Five. Viva la Five! to Bukharalov, general headquarters of Duruti column. Duruti giving instructions. Preparations for a new conquest. This time it is Sietemo, taken and lost by other anti-fascist forces. The Duruti column never retreats and will take the town or die in the attempt. Duruti again, everywhere he appears, with a friendly word, a friendly smile. His simplicity has won in the hearts of the militia the profoundest comradeship and absolute faith in his leadership. Oh, 
course, is set off to explore. There will be fierce fighting and heavy sacrifices. But dauntless, the guerrilleros of the Fai will triumph over all obstacles unto victory.
courageous combatants of the Cerite Fai advance from house to house, through smoking houses and crumbling walls, driving back the hordes of fascism. harassed by war and ruins, will be cared for and provided by the Army of Liberty. The fascists are still about, and our men move about with precaution. Fierce fighting recommences. A barricade of loose boards ingeniously improvised to protect the movements of our militia. Comrade is rescued by his pals. attended with infinite care and transported to the rear by Red Cross ambulance. An improvised hospital train. Houses are perforated by bullet shots and shells. Ruins, ruins everywhere. The tragic evidence of the destructiveness and barbary of the fascist war engendered by the protagonists of Kultur. The battle is over. The international group of the Duruti Column. The militia prepared to go further. A fat war trophy. cannon captured from the fascists.
the walls of the ruins of Sietemo. Behind the line, a welcome lull in the fighting allows the men to wash. A flock of sheep is gathered in by the militiamen who often must provide their own rations as they find it in the countryside. The dinner bell rings and is heartily responded to by the hungry lads. The men love their guns. They call Minovia, meaning sweetheart. The press arrives bringing the latest news. A mass meeting in Barcelona ends with a popular concert directed by Maestro Toldera. Revolutionary hymn, Hijos del Pueblo, Sons of the People. A Russian ship brings food to the women and children of Spain and receives a hearty welcome. In rebel territory, legions of Moors revive the past invasions of Spain. But this time, they have been recruited by a Spanish general to terrorize his own people. The Spanish masses refuse to bow down to a dictator's whip. And the workers fight bravely. They're overwhelmed by the superiority of arms and munitions furnished by Franco's unofficial allies. Leaving ruins and massacred population in Badajoz, Irun, and other cities, mercenary troops, foreign tanks, and flames sweep the countryside. The sadly famous Alcazar, where workers, women, and children were seized at the beginning of the war by the rebel garrison and kept as hostages to shield the fortress from total destruction by the loyal forces. Toledo fell in spectacular fight, followed by the usual sight of fleeing refugees and mangled bodies. As more prisoners are executed, the rebels plan the first big drive on Madrid. All anti-fascist forces are called to defend the capital, and Duruti musters over 6,000 of his men and prepares to leave at once to help their Castilian brothers.
These men, loving life, are ready to die in order that a new life be born, a life of equality, a life of justice for all men. As the caravan departs, the townsfolk see the militiamen off with hearty cheers. Even children have sensed the heavy sorrows of war. But one thought is in the minds of these people, to be free. And for this freedom, no sacrifice is too great. In early November, 1936, the whole world waited for Madrid to fall. An iron ring, a ring of terror was drawn around the capital. But Madrid did not fall. Madrid's million inhabitants said, we would rather die on our feet than live on our knees. The world waited for Madrid to surrender. But Madrid did not surrender. The populace formed a human wall around the capital, and the loyal forces drove back Franco's troops to their entrenchments outside the city gate. Militiamen advanced to the limits of the Casa de Campo sector, where they construct parapets of defense. The enemy counterattacks again and again, hurling shells and hand grenades. But Madrid has raised a wall of earth and fire, a wall of stones and proletarian bodies against the hordes of Moors and the Foreign Legion. in the air. Madrileños go about their daily tasks in the main square, Puerta del Sol, where the pavements and walls show the destruction caused by the fascist flames. Exasperated by failure, Franco orders his mercenary pilot to bombard the open city, spreading havoc and panic among the civilian population who rush to cellars and subways for shelter. Again and again the pirates of the air appear. The streets are swept by machine gun fire and the barbarous fury of arrogant generals descend on the defenseless bodies of innocent victims. Help for the besieged city. Men from all parts of the world arrive and organize the International Brigade. Men and women who believe that Madrid's fight is their fight. And by defending Spain, they are defending the dearest gifts of human civilization. Writers, scientists, veterans of the World War who had vowed never to take up arms again, do not hesitate to shoulder rifles in defense of the Spanish people.
the stage of Madrid has entered a phase of artillery duels. Constant battles go on around the Francesa's Bridge. The new soldiers of the people have learned to maneuver their batteries with expert precision. They fire on the enemy's position across the bridge and score frequent hits on the Casa de Velasquez. After shell bursts in the insurgent stronghold across the river Montanares, where the enemy's forces are encamped. The enemy continues to launch offensive after offensive, but is always thrown back. Day after day, the city is strafed from the air. Fires break out, ruins pile up, and casualties mount. And at a time when his inspiring presence and leadership was most needed, Buenaventura Duruti, the popular leader of the Senate Fai, fell in action on the Madrid front. His corpse arrives in Barcelona, and the funeral procession starts from the regional headquarters, accompanied by vast masses of people. Duruti's coffin is carried on the shoulders of his closest comrades. Duruti's widow accompanied by friends. Band of Barcelona, led by La Motte de Grignon, famous Catalan composer, plays Chopin's funeral march. of the American consulate at half mass. has Barcelona witnessed such a manifestation of popular grief. Like a huge wave, the multitude moves slowly forward in their last tribute to the fallen hero and friend of all. The banner of the fire waves in a last message of farewell. The bitter reality of war takes us back to Madrid, 
where thousands of other brave men have given their lives in defense of the capital. Bitter fighting, the militiamen have developed into a trained and disciplined army. Not an army of conscripts or professional soldiers obeying their superiors on the pain of death, but truly an army of the people fighting with enthusiasm and courage for a popular cause, for the defense of a common will and right to determine their own destiny. This small anti-tank cannon has a tremendous power to perforate the solid steel walls of enemy tanks. shell after shell into the ruins of the hospital clinico, where a large force of insurgents is entrenched. The university city, in the words of Herbert Matthews, has developed into the most fantastic front ever imagined. Back and forth, the armies dispute the buildings in perhaps the bitterest fighting on the Madrid front. continues to attack the open city more than it does its defenders. Day after day, the raiders' heavy bombs cleave through buildings and their shells burst through the walls of houses. The insurgent batteries and planes do not aim for military objectives. They aim to kill, burn, and terrorize whole populations in the attempt to break down their resistance and obtain a bloody victory. A new strategy of warfare has been introduced in the Spanish War. The latest instruments of death and destruction are directed not on the defending army, but on the peaceful populations of cities, towns, and villages. Women and children waiting in line for bread are murdered by machine gun bullets of enemy planes. The workers' quarters are singled out for the most diabolical destruction. Whole families are buried under the wreckage. It is by these criminal, cold-blooded acts of terror and devastation that the totalitarian powers of Europe hope to conquer Spain and seize its rich mines of coal, copper, and iron to supply their huge munition plants. Madrid, Irún, Guernica, Almería are in ruins. Hundreds of thousands of Spaniards have been slain. 
But still the people of Spain hold out. They hold out with even greater determination, inspired with the ideal that they are defending not only their own freedom, but the freedom of the whole world. Countless homes are broken up. There is a constant trickle of poor families carrying away whatever belongings they have been able to salvage out of the ruins. Most of these incredible people remain. A slogan has arisen from their heart. No pasaran. They shall not pass. Fear, the supreme weapon of fascism, has been shattered against the courage of the most amazing hero in all history, the masters of Spain.